Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's the 9th of September and it's time for some more Deep Space updates. And yeah, obviously everybody else is talking about uh, the Queen, Her Majesty, uh, Elizabeth II, finally passing and uh, King Charles III coming along. It's not really that relevant to space, but I think it is worth mentioning that she was monarch from before the start of the space race up to the current day which is kind of wild to think of all the orbital spaceflight I talk about is, is covered by basically the sort of career, whatever you call it, of a, yeah, a single person. Anyway, um, more importantly, Deep Space Update, we always start with the launches. And yeah, I don't have a huge amount this, this time. We start on the 31st of August. And of course, this was the day after uh, something else that we were expecting to happen. Uh, Falcon 9 launched uh, 46 Starlink satellites, Group 3-4 from Vandenberg. And not much to say about that, except for the fact that I could see it from my house and the trail looked extra red because of the amount of smoke in the air. It's actually not that bad, but there was, it was kind of reddish and I presume that is due to smoke in the atmosphere. Um, so on the 2nd of September, we there was a Long March 4C launching from Jiquan. It was a Yogan military reconnaissance satellite going into a sun-synchronous orbit. Don't know very much about this, unfortunately. 5th of September, Falcon 9 launching uh, Starlink Group 4-20. Yes, uh, smoking it, blazing it. This was, a, this was actually a rideshare mission. So there was like 51 Starlink satellites. And then alongside, they had Spaceflight Inc.'s uh, Sherpa LTC-2 space tug which was carrying a Boeing Varuna like technology demonstrator, right? So the Boeing satellite was going to demonstrate V-band communication. That's up in like 40 to 75 gigahertz range. So this is really, really getting up into those super high frequencies. Uh, the Sherpa LTC is basically a space tug. The idea is it gets dropped off at a, you know, the orbit where they're getting ready to deploy the Starlink satellites, and then it's going to use its own propulsion to move to the higher orbit. That's one of like Space Flight Inc.'s capabilities. They, um, so anyway, that went off just fine. The 6th of September, there was Kwaizu, uh, another Kwaizu 1A launch. Of course, that's the spacecraft built by X-Pace. X pace to be clear. Uh, I, this is another launching another couple of Senti space satellites. These are uh, low earth orbit commercial you know navigational enhancement satellites as, according uh, well, according to what they say. Not really clear but they are talking about a constellation of over like 160 I read in some places. Same day there was also a long march 2D carrying a, uh, a trio of Yogan 35 satellites, again, military reconnaissance satellites that we do not know very much about. And finally, on the 7th, we had Ariane 5 carrying Eutelsat's Connect VHTS. That's a very high throughput satellite. Uh, that was a satellite going to geostationary orbit. Uh, it's the largest satellite that has ever been built by Telus Alunia. Uh, 8.8 meters tall, 29 feet, something like six and a half tons. And this thing is going to deliver internet speeds of 500 gigabits per second. Although I think those are, you know, have to be portioned out into regions. So it's not like a, it's going to be a Starlink beater necessarily. But yeah, uh, it's also worth noting that we are getting towards the end of Ariane 5's career. There's only three more Ariane 5 launches in the pipeline. Ariane 6 should hopefully be flying before the end of the year. Otherwise, well, Ariane Space is going to be really running out of rockets since they can't fly Soyuz anymore. Anyway, a notably lacking from the launch schedule was, of course, SLS, which had two declared launch dates, neither of which went all the way to through the countdown to zero. There were a handful of problems on the first one, some of which were pro addressed, some of which weren't a big deal. But on the first launch attempt, the killer, the thing that seemed to shut them down, was that they weren't seeing the engine temperatures on engine number three coming down close enough. They have to drop the temperature down to minus 420 so that when they actually start up the engine, there isn't shock cooling of the engine by the liquid hydrogen. Um, so anyway, th this was sort of notable because this 
Well, this had been expected to work. It had been demonstrated in the green run. But when they actually did the dress rehearsals, the two wet dress rehearsals, they never actually managed to get through to this. And NASA engineers basically said, what are the odds that this one thing that we are not testing is going to be a problem? And they elected to proceed with an actual launch attempt. And that indeed turned into be turned out to be another wet dress rehearsal. A couple of days later, they came back and they said, actually, the data we were getting from this made it look like the, the cooling was actually happening. We just weren't seeing it properly because the sensor wasn't reporting. It was probably a bad sensor. So they rescheduled the launch to the Saturday. Uh, and plan, part of that plan was they would start the fueling and then they would run the engine chill early in the timeline so that they could see other related readings to ensure that the cooling was happening as expected. Unfortunately, this time around, they got a hydrogen leak in the interface to ground service equipment. And that meant that they never really got started with loading up the core fuel tank, which led to a second scrub. And most people had at this point expected that they would have to roll this thing back to the uh, vehicle assembly building. And it turns out that they might be able to get away with this. So first of all, they're going to do some repairs to the ground service equipment interface. They're going to change like the seal around it and see if they can fix it and test it on the pad. They can't launch immediately because the launch window where the moon is in the correct position has come to an end and they have to wait for the next one to come around. The next launch window, however, also coincides with the launch of Crew-5, you know, uh, SpaceX Dragon carrying crew to the International Space Station. And that's going to have to launch off an adjacent pad and that will take priority, which means SLS can't really launch during the time that they're prepping that. So they only have a few days at the early part of the launch window where they could launch this. So if they fix this and they go through and they demonstrate the thing is sealed, I thought that they would then roll this back to the vehicle assembly building and then wait until the next launch window. But it sounds like they're actually going to leave it on the pad, not roll it back, because rolling back actually, you know, puts stresses on the vehicle. There's vibrations and forces on it, which they are trying to minimize. And they're going to try and launch it, I think, uh, September 23rd or September 27th of the two windows. Now, to do this, they will have to get another waiver because... The vehicle on the pad has its flight termination system all plugged in and armed, and these have to have their own batteries that have to have enough power to wake up, run the system during the launch, and then fire and trigger the explosives if there's a problem. The like flight termination system is incredibly important. It was originally certified for two weeks, and I think they got it extended to 20 days. They can't change these batteries on the launch pad. They have to actually roll it back to the vehicle assembly building to do this. But it sounds like NASA is going to ask for these to be certified for something like 40 days. And sure, one might wonder why they didn't ask. If they thought it could do 40 days, why didn't they ask for that earlier? It would have solved a whole lot of problems. Yeah, um, th so that's possibly what happens. If they can't get the certification, they'll have to roll it back, change out the batteries, and I don't think they will necessarily have time to then roll it back out and launch. Uh, flight termination, of course, is a very important thing. <laughs> like, I think Wayne Hale on Twitter basically said, wow, I, you know, I can remember the number of times we asked for FTS, uh, you know, what is it, uh, you know, change of, of rules, some leniency regarding the rules around flight termination. And generally, those requests were rejected. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's great. So SLS not having a lot of fire. Meanwhile, SpaceX has had a little too much fire regarding its uh, testing Starship and their super heavy booster. So they've been continuing engine testing. And yesterday, Starship 24, for the first time, fired up all six of its Raptor engines in an eight second test fire, which was absolutely spectacular and also started a brush fire. And the local fire, you know, fighting, they basically just let the stuff burn out and then did minimal amount of control to stop it spreading too far. Because it is out in this kind of peninsula area. There's a lot of wetlands. It's hard for a grass fire to really go anywhere and threaten any uh, human uh, stuff. 
So also during this fire, it's knocked off. Woof. Many, many tiles got knocked off. This was the first time they fired it with full power and sure enough, they lost a lot more tiles and they're going to have to continue to troubleshoot this and come up with potentially a better solution because of course, Starship, the rapid reusability and refueling absolutely depends on being able to re-enter, which depends on these heat shield tiles working. They don't want to spend forever rebuilding the heat shield after every single flight. So uh, yeah, that's that's a, a thing. We also got like some booster tests as well. I think we saw like three engines firing on that. Anyway, uh, na elsewhere, NASA made a $228 million award for their first state uh, spacesuits under the new contract. They are asking Axiom Space to develop the spacesuit to be used on the first Artemis landing mission. Uh, the, of course, the design of the suit is still super, super secret, but NASA basically have confirmed who will be building it. So Axiom will be building the moonwalking system, and that doesn't mean it walks backwards. It means it is going to be walking on the moon, hopefully. Uh, it'll be the first spacesuits used on the moon. Uh, yeah, it'll be really fascinating to see how those actually compare against the Apollo suits. Uh, Rocket Lab, they announced that they are signing on uh, with the US Department of Defense rocket cargo program. They want to use the Neutron launch vehicle to deliver cargo anywhere in the world, point to point in 45 minutes or less, or, you know, get your money back or something like that, right? There's all in deep space, there's trouble with the Galaxy 15 satellite that's in geostationary orbit. This is an Intelsat satellite that sits over the west coast of California. It's used for communications. On August 19th, there was a fairly energetic solar storm, and they basically appear to have lost control of the spacecraft. It, like, it continued to transmit, which was fine, but it's not able to adjust its orbit. It's not responding to a lot of commands, and they basically have had to take this, the, the radio state of the TV stations and all the communications that were on that satellite and transfer them to other satellites in the area because what's happening is without the ability to control its orbit, it's starting to slide away from where it should be and therefore they have to turn off its transmitter so it doesn't interfere with anything else. They already have Galaxy Sat uh, 33 scheduled for launch later in the year. So they're going to have a replacement very, very soon. And they have the spare capacity to, to keep themselves going. That's one of the advantages, of course, operating lots of satellites. You know, you can just shift your loads around as is necessary. Uh, also, interesting story is that OrbitFab have announced that they are going to be selling fuel to satellites on orbit. And they've set the price of 100 kilograms of hydrazine at $20 million for that price, they will fly up to your spacecraft, rendezvous with it, and use a, you basically pump in 100 kilograms of fuel and take $20 million. So their, their fuel depot is going to fly in an orbit that is 300 kilometers above geostationary orbit. They've basically made this proposal that 300 kilometers above geostationary should be what's called a service orbit, where Things like mission extension vehicles and refueling stations sit and you know, travel to whatever satellites in geostationary orbit need to be serviced. Now, the problem with OrbitFab's system is that to transfer fuel, they need to have a compatible valve-like interface on the satellite. And most satellites don't have this. It's called a, a rapidly attachable fu fluid transfer interface. Uh, you know, basically, this is something that OrbitFab developed. Now, most of the satellites up there are too old to have this, and there is a sort of chicken and the egg problem in that if you can refuel those satellites, if, if those satellites were launched today, they might have them, but then they wouldn't be failing today. The ones that are failing are the ones that launched, you know, a decade ago. But Northrop Grumman and uh, who else? Astroscale, they're both launching or working with mission extension vehicles that will fly up to satellites, rendezvous to the back of them, and then provide new guidance and pointing capabilities. And those, those can have these fuel ports. So OrbitFab is wanting to get deals with Astroscale and Northrop Grumman to refuel their satellites on orbit so that they can extend 
the satellite, the life of satellites are already there. And they have actually signed a deal to deliver xenon to astroscale. So that's uh, like there is precedence for this. Uh, okay, uh, Astra, Astra have we all know that they are have basically stopped developing their small satellite launch vehicle and are building a bigger one. But they did announce that they are selling a lot of ion like electric thrusters to OneWeb for their constellation. So they basically when Astra did their deal that got them all this funding from the markets, they used some of that money to buy a company called Apollo Fusion. And they've now restyled the engines that they were developing as the Astra Spaceflight engine. OneWeb are a good customer. They're going to be launching a ton of satellites. And previously, they had to buy their electric propulsion engines from a company called Fakel, who is uh, Russian. Therefore, not in the market anymore. Uh, OneWeb also had to take like a big write-off in terms of the, the cost because of money they basically spent on Russian launch capability that they're not getting supplied. Uh, okay, Ursa Major. Uh, they, interestingly enough, they they are designing these high performance, you know, closed cycle engines. There's a view, an engine called the Hadley, and the U.S. Air Force gave them three point six million dollars to further develop and test this because the Air Force Research Laboratory is interested in using this high performance engine for their X sixty A hypersonic test vehicle. And uh, finally, finally, very close to home for me, and I have to be very careful, I'm not an unbiased observer on this front, right? Uh, basically, uh, Apple, Apple's new iPhone 14 has satellite connectivity built in. It is a very limited satellite connectivity. And I'm gonna say it was not the greatest kept secret and there's nothing to do with me, but uh, yeah, sure. While a lot of websites are talking about the fact that it has a cool screen, an amazing camera, or the fastest CPU you can buy on a phone, I'm more interested in the fact that you can send messages to satellites anywhere in the world. So the way this works is it's going to use the uh, Global Star constellation. And Global Star revealed, like basically after the announcement, that they are allocating 85% of their satellite network bandwidth to supporting Apple. Uh, the messages that can be sent aren't going to be like everyday text messages. They're basically, find my iPhone, right? If you're in the middle of nowhere, again, and you have no cell connectivity, you can tell everybody where you are, or you can send uh, an emergency request. Like, I am injured, I've been in a crash, I am in the middle of nowhere and freezing to death and there are snakes and bears surrounding me. I'm not sure you can be that specific, but it's, you send up a message like that through multiple choice and then you angle your phone and it picks up a satellite and hopefully sends that out and then it will include your location so that they can follow you, get you back. Now, this, I know what you're all saying. This is not nearly as cool as what SpaceX announced a couple of weeks ago with T-Mobile. To be clear, the SpaceX T-Mobile deal to deliver actual cell phone connectivity to every cell phone uh, is clearly more capable. It will also be available on iPhone. So it's not like it's not like you're losing anything. It's just something you have to wait for. And indeed, given the FAA might not actually happen anytime soon, or it might not happen in every single territory. Uh, this is available now. And, uh, you know, I guess that's going to work for some people. So, yeah, look, I, I can't really go too far into this. I think it's a uh, there's a lot that I would like to talk about that I can not that I have anything to do with it. But yeah, that is my news for the week. Uh, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.